welcome to News Click. Today, we're very pleased to have with us Professor Ajaz Ahmed, well known Marxist commentator, scholar, author of the very great classic book, In Theory, and the book um, which I particularly like, The Imperialism of Our Times. Um, we're going to talk today about the world in the middle of COVID 19. Ajaz Ahmed, welcome to News Click. Thank you very much. Well, it's a very curious time. We have this global pandemic. Uh, as we speak, 5.2 million people infected by the disease. And yet, it seems in the middle of all this, despite the UN Secretary General asking for a ceasefire, the United States seems to be ramping up its belligerence against Iran, against Venezuela, and against China. How should one start to understand the behavior of the United States government in the middle of something where we should, it seems, be focusing on the health issue and not on war? First of all, as you well know, the Indian, the, uh, the US administration, Trump uh, himself and people close to him, were extremely reluctant to start with to recognize the magnitude of what was coming. And uh, it is really because of their negligence and belligerence on the front of introducing the, uh, <clears throat> the restrictions that uh, very, uh, very important studies are showing that had they taken it more seriously, uh, <clears throat> they would have saved many, many more lives, maybe 30,000, maybe 50,000, whatever. Uh, perhaps half the people have died. So what is the sort of refusal to see what they are up against? Similarly, a refusal to see what can happen if they do not continue to be careful and concentrating on the issue of what this pandemic means for their own people in a broader perspective. First week of April, when pandemic is full blown, Trump issues an executive order which says the United States has the right, the, the people and company, citizens and companies of the United States have the right to use, to <coughs> to go to the moon and use the minerals and other resources of the moon. Uh, the executive order says that the space is not uh, <clears throat> a, 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 a common space uh, for humanity. It is for the United States and like-minded states to do that and so on. So belligerence is of this order. It is on the level of the cosmos. You know? And they, they have announced that they're going to initiate this program in which by 2024, they're going to establish a credible human uh, presence on the moon and they're going to start this whole exploitation. Now, you see, what interests me, the reason I, I uh, brought it up is that this gives you some, some sense of what lies behind their belligerence towards individual countries. There's a question of a, sort of the mind of the early colonial period of we can establish a preemptive right to the resources of the world and now of the cosmos. Uh, and any challenger who comes will be beaten back. This is early colonialism. 
uh, extended now to space. Uh, <coughs> Venezuela, largest deposit of um, oil and oil and so on. So oil, gas, Iran, Venezuela, and so on. Second preemptive right, third unique American power. Um, which is, which is, you know, the, the, the very uh, idea at the heart of all of this, Venezuela, Iran, China, any country, I've, I've written this um, earlier that third world nationalism has been for the United States since the Second World War, since the decolonization movements began, as dangerous as communism. And these are the states which refuse to follow um, the American uh, dominance. Now, I think what Trump is doing, one is the sheer human callousness, exactly the question that you asked, that in the midst of this pandemic, you are escalating and being more and more belligerent on this when 35 million people in your country have lost jobs. You can't take care of them, but you want to, you know. So there's that kind of callousness. That is specific to this administration. But the policies of belligerence towards Venezuela, Iran, China are older. Um, the whole anti-China strategy of what these days it's called hybrid war, warfare or whatever, um, <clears throat> full spectrum dominance and, and all that. that. That has been in place since about 2010. Uh, <clears throat> as soon as uh, uh, China made the kind of uh, breakthrough across the front of technology, economic production, uh, industrial development, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> so that the so-called pivot to Asia was actually Obama. Uh, now you are at a different point and we can also talk about that. What is specific, I think, about this particular administration is a sheer incompetence. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind of invasion that they mounted against Venezuela is simply laughable. They could even carry that, you know, earlier American administrations, the way they fought against Nicaragua, for example, compare that to what they tried to do to Venezuela. And the sheer level of incompetence, a country that is suffering so very much. You know, Cuba was different. At that time, the Soviet Union was there to support. Um, so any kind of American sanctions, embargo and so on, Cuba could bear. Venezuela cannot because there is no such power outside. Venezuela is beating, bleeding, beating back. And yet all you can muster is this kind of, so what is sheer incompetence, um, inability to figure out their own stuff. Uh, the other thing is that there's a kind of a thing about Trump that he's playing uh, to his, his main concern is to get elected and to sort of strut it out on the world stage where his uh, <clears throat> voters base, this far right voters base, which is solidly behind him, that so much of it is because of that, much of the, this belligerence is also highly rhetorical. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, particularly about China, a lot of it is really 
rhetorical and they are creating this a new kind of atmosphere of you know far beyond the uh, just a second cold war um <clears throat> uh, there is uh, the committee of present danger china has now been activated it's the fourth time this committee of present danger has come into being this time against china uh, a lot of it is rhetorical a lot of it is that they really are caught because china's strengths they cannot match literally where china is strong they cannot match the only language they know is military belligerent could you uh, no I, i think that's very interesting because you're saying that at least for this administration there's a callousness there's incompetence and then there's a kind of rhetorical overreach um but i think that you you've said something i think which needs a little more for uh, people who are listening which is when you say that there are the strengths of china uh, which might be a barrier to um this kind of imperialism what are some of those strengths and how should one understand them very obvious one which everyone talks about which is the sheer it is the only truly productive country in the world it is what america some 70 80 years ago used to be that's where china is now mm. that is where britain was in the 19 in the early parts of the 19th century it is the only truly manufacturing industrial country in the world where everybody you know and so on so it and there is no stopping that that can only secondly china has now developed a very interesting combination of dominating increasingly dominating the world market and at the same time expanding the home market at a very rapid rate so that in some areas of production in china now wages are higher in some parts of europe so that you know the fact that they have that big home market and they're constantly expanding that home market uh, because of you know rising incomes and wages and so on there is that the cutting edge but there are certain things people don't talk about all that much uh <clears throat> cutting edge technologies china is bypassing the united states increasingly very much the great scientific technological base that they are creating china has now a larger scientific intelligence here than any other country in the world not just larger China now has you know one of the uh, measures of it would be that within the last 10 years China from being a you know 10th or 12th is now the leading power in the world in the number of patents they got last year four times as much as the united states so uh, <clears throat> you know in the the cutting edge technologies china is forging far ahead now this is not something small technological monopoly is one of the, is one of the absolutely central monopolies that the western powers have had against the rest of the world if you can break through that and go to the other side and start dominating the whole range of technological fields the kind of public education that they have um any number of actual tests that have been done on a multi country level about 2 years ago there was a there was a study done where students from the, all the advanced capital of the advanced countries including china 
uh, you know, 15 year old kids. Uh, <clears throat> they were given the same exams and so on and so on. Shanghai based kids were much ahead of any of the American kids. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have a very different, and so that shows you the trajectory of bad Chinese. You know, this is their strength towards the future. These very kids, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, will be the middle ranking scientists and financials and so on and so forth. So these are the strengths. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, what they have is a very different kind of coherent foreign policy, which is, which is above board and based on mutual advantage. Americans know how to dictate and military is that and the other. What, what the Chinese are doing is, you know, because they have surplus capital, because they have immense amount of technological know-how, they can go to multiple countries, dozens of countries, and say, we can give you finance, we can give you technology. And in lieu of that, uh, <clears throat> these resources and so on. Therefore, China, whose main problem is, really the main problem is, its vulnerability on the front of all kinds of resources, including energy resources. That's, that's what the, where the weakness is for China. And other kind of resources, uh, the, the China is trying to guarantee in all kinds of ways, but, but when it comes to something like petroleum, gas, and so on, that vulnerability is very great. And I would think that China's main vulnerability to the United States is that. That is something the, the, the US. And again, that is a military threat. But that's all they have. In the military field, as a matter of fact, from what I have read, uh, China is first of all a defensive power. It's not an aggressive power, nor does it need to be. Uh, it has enough finance, enough technological resource, enough to offer countries to cooperate with it. Um, but in the, in, it, it is a defensive power, and now it has broken the barrier where its defensive structure is too strong for the Americans to, um, to take on in any sort of way. Uh, so in a peculiar sense, I think some Americans are understanding that the time may have passed or that this may be the time when you can stop China from, you know, et cetera. Um, but but in, in America, that, that nervousness about China is very, very important, is, is very great. So this administration turns it into this very vulgar kind of belligerence, which plays to the white supremacist electoral base inside. So how much of it is bluster and how much of it is real is very hard. You're right. As you said, there is a rhetorical overreach in Mr. Trump in general. On the other hand, the Indo-Pacific Command, which is the U.S. government's military arm in that part of the world, had published a new article called Regain the Advantage, which is a concession that there's some drain of power and that somehow the United States needs to regain the advantage. If you were a rational government in New Delhi, and I'm not saying that this government is not rational in its own way, it has its own rationality. Yeah, but, but I know. If I were, yeah, if you were a rational government in Delhi, um, why would you toe the line of this Indo Pacific strategy that the United States is pushing to regain its advantage? You know, who's lining up behind the US Indo Pacific strategy? It's Japan, which is basically a client state of the United States, even now, Australia, and India. Right. What is India doing? You see, 
you see, <laughs> two or three uh, things I would say. One is that this again is nothing new. This quad <laughs> was formed some ten, some ten years ago, or a little more perhaps. Um, at that time, China was also a weaker compared to today. Uh, it was already, you know, on its way. But it compared to today, China, every two years, the, the scale of power changes in China. And now it is becoming increasingly more crazy uh, to be in that. So they're caught. On the one hand, they're, you know, these are far right guys, you know, Bolsonaro and Modi and, and these guys. This kind of, uh, you know, essentially, essentially the axis of evil in the world today is really the United States, Israel, and India. You know, so far the states are concerned, the governments are concerned. Um, but they are, again, they are caught, there's a logic of capital. This is also the government that is very keen to become a full member of the Shanghai process. This is a government that, again, India just doesn't know what to do with China. And again, again, the only thing they know is to work up the boundary dispute. That is not the game China is going to play with you. You do something irresponsible, they'll punish you right there on the spot. But there will be no rhetorical escalation you know so the, the the indian government as it is constituted its entire mentality takes it into this indo-pacific command and so forth it's very dangerous game that, that they're playing um, at the same time they must be sitting there must be sections of the indian bourgeoisie and the foreign service, which want to have a normal relationship. You know, people like uh, Ambani and so on want, want Chinese to come and build their factories. So, you know, so India has caught in a contradiction in this. And it doesn't know how to live in its own neighborhood. It has never known it. This government is, is the worst in that regard. India has never known how to live like a decent member of that uh, community of South Asian states in which it is very powerful. Great phrase. India doesn't know how to live in its neighborhood. I think we'll come back another day and pursue that, make that the centerpiece of the conversation, uh, India and its neighborhood. Uh, very illuminating on the United States, particularly on Trump's incompetence, um, belligerence and callousness, but also rhetorical overreach. And of course, on the um, you know, nature of the Chinese experiment and where it's going. Uh, Professor Ajaz Ahmed, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.